computers and people bring information in, they process it, they store it, they retrieve it when they need it, they might process it again and then pass it on. Because both computers and humans follow those same basic steps, um, you'll see a lot of computer-like models used to try to describe human behavior. This raises the field of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence can be defined as trying to build machines that behave the way people do. Okay, so then this raises a question, can you get to the point where computers actually think? Can we start talking about co computer cognition? Um, now, not every cognitive psychologist studies this. A lot of cognitive psychologists um, only use computers to try to help them understand human cognition, and they're not actually trying to build a machine that um, replicates human behavior. And that's actually the approach that we're going to take in our class. But let's consider for this for a second the, uh, the question of can computers think? You've got a, a picture here of the most famous researcher um, to tackle that question, and his name is Alan Turing. Uh, Turing worked um, before and during World War II to try to build a computer that could crack the codes that um, Nazis were using to direct their U-boats. So he was trying to come up with a way to, a computerized way to understand what signals, unknown signals, meant. So he had a ton of expertise in this area and some people would argue that Alan Turing uh, saved Britain. So very powerful, very influential man. And he thought about the question of do computers think? And he came up with this idea of how you could test when will we know if computers think? It's a beautiful test. Uh, you take someone like me and you have me face two rooms. One room has a computer in it, the other room has a person in it. And I can ask questions by computer to both rooms. When I get to the point where the answers that I get to the responses confuse me about which room has a computer and which room has a person in it, according to Turing, that's when you can say that computers can think. So we call this the Turing test. It is a test that's run annually. Um, and so far, it hasn't exactly been passed. However, um, there is a version of the Turing test that I'm going to have you complete in this week's lab activities where you try to differentiate uh, social media posts that were generated by people and those that were generated by a bot. I also want to show you um, an old-fashioned version of uh, an attempt to computerize a therapist. Yeah, a therapist. Um, now, there's a, you know from your other psychology classes that there's a type of therapy called Rogerian therapy, named after a fellow named Carl Rogers, so a Rogerian. Um, and in Rogerian therapy, um, a, a lot of the job of the therapist is to listen very carefully and essentially repeat back what their clients have said. And someone built a computer um, that you'll use in your lab this week um, that simulates a Rogerian therapist. And it is kind of funny how engaging this very simple and old-fashioned program is. Um, so what, I, what I'm uh, trying to say is, do computers think? I don't know. I know that it's a very big and a very long-standing debate. Um, the question gets a little more complicated with each passing year. Um, some philosophers will argue that computers can't think until they have intentionality. Right? As long as they're just responding to commands without having their own internal intentions, then some philosophers would say that um, because computers are not intentional, they therefore are not um, thinking. 
but computers are getting better and better, faster and faster. So I wouldn't want to have that argument too much longer. Um, okay. Both computer scientists and cognitive psychologists love building models. We build structural models and process models. Structural models tell you about um, what parts of the brain, and when we're talking about cognitive psychology, structural models tell us what parts of the brain do various things. So um, it, it might be hard to see, but there's a picture uh, of the human brain um, on your slide, and it shows you different parts of the brain that are involved in the process of visual perception, interpreting the information that our eyes take in. Um, there are also process models. So structural models are sort of where, process models are how. What exactly happens to information as it's being processed in the brain? Um, because of the computer analogy, some of the concepts from computer science are also used in cognitive psychology, and one of them is channel capacity. And channel capacity is just a fancy way of saying how much information can a channel transmit. So if we think about, I've got a picture there of a, a probably a sewer drain, uh, but it's a big pipe, and pipes are limited in how much water can pass through them. So a little bitty pipe can't pass as much water through it as a big pipe. That's channel capacity. How much information, or in this analogy, water, can pass through a, a pipe or a channel. Um, a carrier pigeon, an old-fashioned phone, very small channel capacity. It's like a narrow pipe. Uh, your cell phone, on the other hand, has huge channel capacity. Can transmit enormous amount of information. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Come back and we're going to talk about measures in cognitive psychology and then I'm going to give you a technique that will improve your performance on exams by a full letter grade without you having to study anymore. Be right back.